Welcome to the hottest real estate topics on the planet, keeping you up to date with all the creative ways to buy and sell real estate without bank qualifying, so anyone can build real income starting today. Here is another great show with Dealmaker Bill and Pete the Rookie. All right, here we are in another episode of Flipping Houses for Rookies. Bill, you think the boys and girls listening are still rookies or are they making some progress? I've been I, I've been really getting a lot lately. In fact, I've had a lot of support tickets from the podcast. So I, I, I guess the format change that we made several months ago is working because I'm getting a lot of feedback by people just asking questions. And honestly, if they send me a support ticket and I'm being too lazy that day, I'll be like, what's your phone number? And I call them oh. <laughs> and I talk to them. It's easier to talk than to type. Uh, for me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you, you're used to flapping your I phones. didn't take typing in, in, in high school and I wish I did. Uh, yeah, we, we were Episode boys. number 157, Pita. How to x-ray your deals the fast and easy way so you won't lose everything. And Emma, the only real est non real estate investor in the room, <laughs> is telling me how long the title is. It is a long <laughs> title, but it tells a story, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Are you worried about losing money on your deals? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Oh yeah. Well, you know, if you do enough activity, even when you're careful, eh, you might have that happen. But I think your solution has <clears throat> always been just do a lot, and it averages out, which is you know it's like diversification or something. Right. So just don't put all your eggs in one basket. And, you know, so here we go. If you're getting started in real estate investing, you may not have the money, which is what you tell me all the time. Dude. I mean, I got news for you. Sometimes you're doing real estate investing and, <laughs> and you, you don't, don't have the money. money. Yeah. It's not just when you start. Yeah. <coughs> oh, my goodness. If you're getting started in real estate investing, you may not have the money or knowledge to invest at first. In fact... Money is probably the reason you're considering real estate investing. That's what you tell me, right? Yeah. Some boys and girls tell me. It's possible you're living paycheck to paycheck, struggling with spending budgets that never seem to work, leaving you with too much month at the end of the money, right? <laughs> and not getting the good things you want in life. If this is the case, this podcast is especially for you because I can free you of some of the beliefs and feelings you may have about doing safe and secure deals so you don't have to lose everything. The miracle of knowing to look for uh, the miracle of knowing what to look for is all you need to be safe and secure in your deals. And this episode, I'm going to cover two documents. I use, which is actually three documents. I didn't realize it's actually three documents mm -hmm. I use to make sure this is happening in every one of your deals. So what I'm going to do in this episode is I'm actually going to put me, the guy that's done hundreds of deals, in every deal that every listener is going to make from here on out. Wow. And the way I'm going to do that is is I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to indoctrinate them in this episode. Mm -hmm. And they use, if they listen to this episode, more than once, I hope, so they get it all. I'm going to explain to them how I use these documents and how I've spent endless amounts of time making this document. And I've done millions and millions of dollars worth of real estate with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something. I think we did this a long time ago. But I didn't bother. To, I was being too lazy to go back and check because it was so long ago. That if I can't remember it, that I'm sure yeah. our listeners aren't going to be able to remember it. Yeah. So today I'm going to cover in great, great detail the prospect suspect form hmm. and how to analyze the data from it so you can use it like a roadmap to guide you through your deal journey cautiously and safely. That's a great idea, Bill. Right? Because yeah. it's, just, it's just something that comes up uh, with my coaching clients. It comes up with uh, the guys that come to the meetup. It comes up with uh, support tickets. And mm -hmm. mostly what I find, and for a very long time, I would receive prospect suspect forms and I would help people analyze deals. But it's it's gotten too big now for me to do that for everybody. I still do it, but not as much as I used to. Yeah. 
in the beginning, I remember we used to say, send us a prospect suspect form. If it wasn't filled out, every line wasn't filled out with something, I wouldn't even return the communication. Sure. You remember that? Sure. You, you get these uh, forms that just have partial data and you can't do an analysis without right. enough info. You just and, can't do it. And, and, and the novice inspector, oh yeah, inspector, the novice investor um, doesn't realize when they're leaving something blank how vital that is. Mm. Or how not vital it is. Mm -hmm. you know, well, when you know you don't have the perception of the importance <clears throat> of things, of what what is or isn't, you right. know, you, you just don't have the experience to, to gauge what might be really relevant or not. It really comes down to the ideal scene. They need to, if they've done enough deal structuring, they would know what's important and why it's important. Mm -hmm. But everything on that document has a reason, and we're going to go over that today. Cool. Okay. So, what I want to do is I want to pause for a second just for the recording, mm -hmm. and I would like folks to go to flippinghousesforrookies.com forward slash free stuff. Okay, that's flippinghousesforrookies.com forward slash free stuff. And go get the prospect suspect form. Download it mm -hmm. and have it in front of you while you're listening to the rest of this episode. Now, for those of you that are listening to us live on Facebook, um, we can, and can we upload that document to Facebook? No. Okay. So, anyways, just just go and download it if you want to listen. But for the recording, for sure, you should pause the recording right now. You should go to flippinghousesforrookies.com forward slash uh, free stuff and download the prospect suspect form. It's a three-page document, and that's what I'm going to be covering. And you should have that in front of you when you're listening to the rest of this podcast. So we're going to pause right now for about two seconds. Okay, here we go. You ready? <clears throat> the first thing you need to know before you fill out anything on this document is <clears throat> I personally, like I said already, I personally have bought millions and millions of dollars with the real estate. And you know that because you've seen it, obviously. Oh, yeah, I was here the other day. You're making a phone call. You had that in front of you in another form. And you're just filling everything in. You know, you're not just, you can't call people up and just have a conversation. How much you want. It's too, right. you know, you have to get facts, details, and this is the guide or else you're just swimming. Right. So I've done millions and millions of dollars with the real estate for me and that much for my students mm. and coaching clients. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm going to tell you that there's not one deal that I've done that hasn't had this form in it. It is, it is my guidebook it's like my bible it's like the thing that i use in every deal now all i do is start with it but at least it gives me a direction <clears throat> and even when we go out to the house every house i go to i carry my presentation pack which is in the leather bound book which you made for me mm -hmm. the leather bound part anyways yeah, not the presentation yeah you made the presentation <laughs> Uh, I need the cover. And right as soon as you open the cover up, the first thing that's there is the prospect suspect form. In fact, there's been times where I've had this on the table, on the kitchen table in front of the client, and there's notes on there for me that they'll they'll ask me about. Oh. <laughs> and sometimes uh, they aren't exactly good notes. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think I'm a suspect? <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> but that's changed. <clears throat> not of any particular crimes. But... Right. The other thing that you should uh, realize is, is not only is this form good for all of the information about the deal, uh, often I turn it over and on the back of it, when I'm done with the call or if I'm during the call, there's things that I need to remember, I put it on the back of the form. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. And honestly, I got to tell you that, that I, I've de dealt with a lot of people with real estate, a lot of investors. Do not rely on your memory. Why? Why because would you? you're, if you do what you're supposed to do, you are going to have too many people to deal with and you're not going to keep track of it in your mind. Mm -hmm. And there's just no reason to clutter your mind up with that. So just make valid notes on the back of it. The other thing is, is that when you get going in the beginning, I know that this is a computer age. I know that there's a lot of technology. I know there's a lot of electronic stuff. I have to tell you, I have to tell you, I have to tell you, this is so 
sounds so archaic, but I'm telling you, it is the best way to do it. And that is to go to Staples or Office Max or any office supply store and get what they call a 31 day file. What it is, is it's like an accordion uh, file. Well, what would you call that? Like a file folder. It's like a, mm-hmm. you know, like the coupon coupon folders that they used to have where they put the coupons in there. Yeah. What's, this, what's the way to sorting right. by this, alphabetical? This is for dates. <clears throat> right. Yeah, for callback. Like, so right? the, 31, the 31 is the 31 days of the month. Yeah. So like if you're talking to somebody on the 6th of the month and they're like, I want you to call me back. You know, in two weeks, then you take that the prospect suspect form and you put it in the two week date. Yeah. And then every day when you're making your calls or you're doing your follow up, you go to the day of the file jacket and you pull out the prospect suspect form. You read the back of it where you put your notes and you're totally briefed. Hmm. Now, you could do this with CRM software. Yeah. <clears throat> if you're pri- if you're privy to all that and you think you're good with that, then go ahead I'm, I'm telling you, <clears throat> there's nothing like, I'm sorry about my throat, I don't know what's going on here. Mm. There's nothing like, yeah, some water. There's nothing like the information on that form. So even when I have used CRM, uh, which CRM is... Uh, customer Relations Management? management. Yeah. Okay. It's either Client or Customer Relation Management. To keep tra- just your what method of tracking your customers and information. And- yeah, it's just so you when you talk to them, you can uh, trigger conversations you would have had with them before. Yeah. So th- the point that I'm trying to make here is is that even if you use a CRM software, uh, scan the prospect suspect form and put it in that software so that you can see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want to get that sig- sig- that's that significant or savvy. Yeah. Personally, I have done the most amount of business when I use a 31-day file and I keep it by my desk. And even now, I'm not I'm not using one right now. But you asked me the other day where do I keep my where I keep my leads mm. and what did I present? To you, you pulled out a folder that fast. It's about three inches thick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I was going through it the other day, and I'm not doing a good job with my follow up. Oh. Uh, so where's I your file? To, <clears throat> I I don't know what I did with it. It's here oh. somewhere. I have to find it. Find so your file. I'll go buy another one. Yeah. So. All right, so that's number one. So Uh everything that you need is on this document. Mm -hmm. So it's more than just, it's like like the file for each house, but Mm. you don't have to have a file because it's all on one piece of paper. Mm. Okay. The other thing that you need to know is is that uh, the reason why this document works like magic is because of a couple reasons. Number one, it tells you if your buyer is motivated and worth your time. Mm. Because probably one of the worst things that happens to any investor that will will burn them out is dealing with too many suspects. Mm. And a suspect is simply somebody that wants all their money. They want it on their terms, which is usually all the money now, without any fees, without any closing costs, they just decided they want two twenty five for their house, and they should get two twenty five and a hundred dollars just because they're good sports. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Enhance them. Yeah. <clears throat> so they, <clears throat> they have no idea what it is, and that's every buyer is. I'm sorry, every seller is like that. Okay. So this is going to tell us if they're motivated. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you deal with too many suspects, you'll burn out. And this is this is the vital tool to figure that out quickly, so you don't get sucked in mm. to the to the real estate game of somebody's motivated. And yeah. we're going to actually go over that when we go over the form. Okay, sure. So the faster you figure that out, and the faster you get out, the less you get beat up. Right. Yeah, and the more you can do later. Right. Because mm-hmm. I mean, I I just I just came through a deal that I dealt with a guy for three months, and he mm-hmm. was absolutely completely a suspect. Yeah. But he was good. Yeah. Okay. So it happens to everybody. It's not just, but, mm. but I'd rather deal with that guy. Know that that's happening all the way along, and deal with him because I came close. Mm-hmm. And really, in the end of the day, it was because I just didn't want to do business with him because he was just. I think he had a crooked nose, a gang, yep. a gangsta. Yeah. All right. Number two. <clears throat> it gives you the math for the deal. Right, and we're going to go over that. So that's important because some deals blow up quickly because of the pure math. Mm-hmm. Okay, now 
the last thing is that this document does not do, and so many of my students do it, and it's a big, 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 huge mistake. Huge mistake. Well, what's that? Every one of them do it. What's that, Bill? It doesn't qualify the house. Oh, of course not. And they try to. And the biggest thing that they try to is when somebody asks a certain price for the house. Oh. They think that that's important. Mm. And in this stage of the game, it's not. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> your deal meeting, when you go out and look at the house, after they've gone through this pre-qualifying checklist that we're going to go through in a minute. Mm-hmm. You know, with the prospect suspect forum and some questions you're going to ask them, and I'm going to give you the questions. Uh, I mean, I've gone all out with this. I mean, we changed uh, about a month ago. Uh, we changed the prospect suspect form documents. So if you've not been to my website recently, you should go back there because there's new documents. Because uh, before it was just the prospect suspect form. Mm-hmm. And now it is not anymore. It's the prospect suspect form. It's additional questions, and there's about twenty five of them, and the and there's a, a pre qualifying checklist, mm-hmm. so you know whether your your buyer, I'm sorry, your seller is motivated or not. And we're going to cover all that. Or just fooling you. Or just fooling you. Yeah. Yeah, because you know you can talk to people and they 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 run a good game, right? But I wouldn't say that they're lying, but it's close. Yeah. You know they're saying what you want to hear, and they're saying what they want to. He- say and it's not real it's right. not going to help you so you have to look through that you have to read with this and get you know, all the right kind of funny you say that because the other day i wrote an email and it was called uh spotting liars yeah and it was one of my lowest open rates really and i thought for sure i even opened that and i tried to watch the video but it was 20 minutes i had to go someplace but like that yeah. was important the girl's a lie spotter yeah and and it was like it was one of my lowest open rates and i'm like yep you're not making offers because if you were that you would be worried about how people lie to you because they ghost you because they'll tell you, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to talk to my wife and I'll call you back. Here's one. I'll give you a classic, classic example. And it's not like the guy intentionally lied to me, Mm -hmm. but I was, uh, uh, last week I was in a house. We were talking about this house in Naugatuck. It's a guy who owes 245 and I made him the offer. Right. And he, and and he's like, well, I got to talk to the wife. So he talks to his wife I go to the house. Now, not not the house that they're selling, the house that they live in. Mm-hmm. So I go to the house, and she like she's like uh, pedantic. You know, she's like, wah, 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 wah. you know, like she like had an agenda. Oh, you know, and, and a pedantic. That's the word I want to say. Pedantic. She's like very like do it this way, do it that way. You know, she's very oh. like. So I go through the drill. So at the end, she's like, well, my friend is a lawyer. Give me documents. So I spend the time to draft the documents because I really, I said, if I, if, if you like the documents, are you going to sell the mm. house to me? Mm-hmm. And it was unanimously yes. Hmm. Right? But there was an attitude all the way along. Oh, well, she was brutal. Jesus. Yeah, she was brutal. But she comes from a family with money, so it doesn't surprise me. I mean, I recognize the lesson. I didn't say nothing, but I recognize the name. They were construction people. Oh. And they had money, and that's. Anyways, so <clears throat> the point is, is that I give them the documents, and it's been like a week and a half. Now, a lot, you know, it was a holiday in the middle because mm. it was Fourth of July, but I don't hear nothing. Mm. So I called him yesterday. Oh yeah, he says uh, one of my buddies has got a transfer or something going on, and he's looking to rent the house. Now I offered him fifteen hundred a month. Mm-hmm. His payments are twenty one hundred. Right? Yeah, he's a uh, he's so over. You're gonna. You can't even pay the whole thing. He had to put money in. Right. So he said to me, I'm going to know in, on August 1st, on August 6th, on whether or not he's going to rent. So now just get get this point now, okay? So first of all, that's three weeks away, mm. August 6th, from when I'm talking to him. Mm-hmm. Right. Everywhere to three, maybe three and a half weeks away. So he's going to pay another mortgage payment. Yep. Then he's going to, so he's going to get $400 more a month from this guy. But he's just going to rent it from him temporarily. And what the guy doesn't, he's not thinking with is, is that I'm telling you from everything that I know, the market's going to change. In 2020, I am certain the market's going to change. Yep. And he's not thinking with that. And he's not going to be able to sell it then. And, he's, and when he comes back to me, my, my 230 is not going to be 230. 
Mm. Matter of fact, even if he comes back to me on August 6th and he says, I'm, I'm probably going to drop him down. I'm going to drop him down 10 grand. Yep. So he doesn't even know that. Mm-hmm. You know, so anyways, my point is, is that the lying part of it was, is that he told me that we had a deal mm-hmm. and to go do the paperwork. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not like malice of forethought, but it happened, right? So, anyways. Sure. Off on a tangent there. The prospect suspect form. Let's get that in front of us. So, the top of it says student name because I use this. Uh, the, the reason why this uh, document was created was for my students to give me deals. Mm-hmm. Right? Nowadays, the only way that I analyze a deal is on the coaching call on Monday nights. Uh, and they upload this document, but I know who it is when yeah. they upload it. Yeah. Uh, so nowadays it's a little bit different than when we first started. Uh, but anyways, it's got the student's name, the student's best number, um, all that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. we, we, we don't talk about that. So the very first thing under that, the very first thing, Peter, the very, 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 very first thing is there for a reason. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait a minute. I want to clarify something. So this has been a confusion. So the for sale by owner script, the FISBO script, Mm -hmm. has some of this language on it. Right. The reason why is because that's an outbound call. Mm -hmm. That's the FISBO script is used for the opening call. The prospect suspect form is used for inbound calls and the closing call. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to talk turkey with a an invest, I mean with a seller, you need to have this form. Yeah. So usually we use this on inbound calls. In other words, people we we send out our, our direct mail, signs, postcards, uh, whatever you know, uh, uh, business cards, right. Whatever they're they're calling us, they leave a message, we call them back, and we fill out this prospect suspect form. So that indicates that they should be a, a higher quality prospect because they're calling us that they want to sell right. a house rather That's than right. I think it was the fizzbow is like we're going fishing, right? And this one's some, a big thing, a big fish landed on the nibble. boat. Yeah, we got a nibble. Yeah. yeah, or they're hooked on the line. Yeah, and we're reeling them in. Yeah, so yeah. that you pay more attention to, you have more questions. It's a longer form, you a little more thorough. Right. And the FISBO, it just makes to see if they're if they're a, a possibility or not. If they are, then you can continue with more of this information, get more data. That's right. That's the difference. That's right. So the very first question is, is do you have a house for sale? <laughs> Why do we ask that question? Because people call up for all kinds of crazy reasons. Helen called the other day. I called her back. Like, no, I don't really want to sell it. My kids are living in it. But people keep asking about the house and want to buy it. How much are you going to give me? Right. <laughs> Or the most famous one. The most famous one is, as well, my dad told me to call and find out what this is all about. Yeah. So who owns the property? My dad. Dad. Yeah. Can I talk to your dad, please? Yeah. <laughs> so you would think you wouldn't have to ask that question. Mm-hmm. But you have to ask that question. Oh, you can go halfway down the form. The guy goes, oh, I don't, I'm not interested in selling. I just want to see what you had to say. Right. Are you that bored? Right. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, they're trying to figure out what their estate's worth. Mm-hmm. And then underneath that is property information. That's the owner's name, address, city, state, phone number. On the top right, it says property type. The reason why we do that is because it could be a single family. It could be a condo. It could be a multifamily. It could be a piece of land. Mm -hmm. It could be a trailer park. You know, it could be all kinds of things. Yeah. So we want to know. Obviously, we we do mostly single family and condos. Mm -hmm. And then this year, we've broken into the multifamily. Right, it's because I want to have more multifamily. So, mm-hmm. and so do you. And then, the old infamous asking price. Uh huh. The asking price. So, what are you asking for the property? All right. And ironically enough, I don't I don't ask that question until I'm halfway through the form. Is that right? Yeah, because I don't care. I so don't care. Yeah. I so don't care. And that's for a couple reasons. Because what is the definition of asking? You can ask. Right. Doesn't mean you're going to get it. Right. So it's just a a preference. Mm -hmm. It's what the seller is looking for. Mm. Right. So, of course, they're going to take a shot at you. You know what I mean? I mean, how many times have I heard, you know, well, well, you know, is which brings me back. Is the house for sale? Well, everything's for sale. 
Oh boy! And as yeah. soon as, as, soon soon as, as you I hear, hear that, that, I got a suspect. Yeah, as soon as you hear that, I had a guy with a condo. Like, how much you want? Half a million dollars. Oh, right. really? Yeah. Why is that? Because that's what I want. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Good luck. Go fishing. Yeah. Go fish for a whale. Right. <laughs> Good luck. So the asking price is just so you have a gauge of uh, what they're about. Mm-hmm. Underneath that is the estimated value. So often if I have someone that says they want a half a million dollars for their condo, I ask them, well, did you have it appraised? Mm. Or how did you come up with that number? Right. Right? Because I want to find out, well, my realtor says that there's one across the street that sold for 700 so mine's worth 500 mm-hmm. you know, or vice versa. They'll give you a story. But ask them, ask them what's the estimated value. It's a good contrast so you don't have to fight with them. Right. It's more impartial. It's not like what do you want. It's like what, what do – what does – the scene, the market think, right. or somebody think, somebody right. beside you. So uh, so that's why I don't care about the asking price because if they say it's worth 325000 like I got a guy that I talked to uh, a couple of days ago about a multifamily house here in Wallingford. It's a three-family. Mm-hmm. And he's like, he he owes one ninety. He he wants two ninety, but he saw my letter and thought I should pay three ten. So well, wait a minute, what'd you say in the letter? So yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mine doesn't say I'll pay more. <laughs> yeah. So I did my Please whole thing with him on house. the phone. He told me he was gonna call the tenants, which I knew was bullshit. Uh he was gonna call the tenants and get me in the house. And then two days later I don't hear from him, I call him back. Well, I talked to the wife and she wants the three ten and you know, a, a conventional deal. And I'm like, mm-hmm. he doesn't get it. And mm-hmm. and I don't even try to convert him at that point because it's like he he just He's making he's making a thousand dollars a month positive cash flow, and he doesn't want to go cut the grass. Mm-hmm. That's what it comes down to. So, there you go. You know, what I mean, it's just but but the asking estimated price tipped me off that he was a suspect. Yep. Okay, that's what my point is. Did he answer? Uh, did he give you a number on the estimated? That different than the three ten. What do you mean? Well, you asked. You said I'm oh, three ten. Oh, yeah, did you yeah, ask him he, what the estimate yeah, is? Yeah, I asked him, and he says, "Yeah, it's like three ten. So he didn't. Oh, it's yeah. street done. Yeah. That's, everybody agrees with me. Yeah. <laughs> it is. So I'm right. The, the point is, is that uh, I don't worry about that till I go to the deal meeting. Mm-hmm. I'm not worried about, I'm not going to argue with him. I'm not going to do any of that until it's time. Mm-hmm. See, what a lot of people don't realize is once you do a lot of deals, it becomes very clear. There's a sequence, there's a process mm. of when you say something and do something that really, really works. And if you prematurely do that thing, mm-hmm. then you blow the deal or or you make the deal rough. Yeah. And that's where I talk about don't shoot from the hip or shoot from the lip. Right. Make sure you know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's just the only way you're going to learn that is to do enough deals or listen to what we're telling you. Actually, listen to us because mm. most people don't. They think you know. They pick and choose what they listen to. They they only hear what they want to hear. Unfortunately, it's kind of like it's kind of like we were talking. I kind of went a little bit weird with it last time, but it's kind of like this. You know, say to a ten year old little girl, Johnny's going to kiss you. Ew! Oh, yeah. I hate boys. Yeah. Right. Yeah. She's ten years old. Yeah. Come back four years later. And she's thinking of it. And she, Johnny's going to kiss you. Oh, really? Does he like me? Yeah. And then come back four more year four, four more years later and say, oh, yeah, well, Johnny's kissed me a bunch of times. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's kind of a weird analogy, but it is how the offer works. Mm-hmm. Until they are aware of what it's, you know, until the little girl's aware of what it's like to be kissed, mm-hmm. you know, and her body's developed and her mind's developed and everything. You know what I mean? It, it does it. It's premature. Yeah. So how do you know what to say when? Right. I mean, is it, I'm, you know, I, I'm liable to say everything too fast. Right. Because I'm trying to, you know, I don't think I'd do it, but I could if I'm not careful because I'm just one of those people that'll tell you what you want to know and tell me your whole story. I'll tell you my whole story. Just get it all out there. But this is a process. Right. So is it something along the lines of don't say anything unless it needs to be said now? Right. So here, here's the deal. What guides you? I have an exact question for this. Mm. So first of all, you're not giving a seminar. Mm-hmm. I do that. I do that when I'm on stage. Mm-hmm. I don't do that in the house. 
So don't listen to me and Pete or go listen to some other podcast and then go in and tell your seller everything. Explain, because he doesn't care how it works. He just wants to hear the parts that he wants to hear. It's like a doctor. When you have a broken leg, you go in and it's like the doctor telling you about all his classes he took on how he's going to fix your leg. You don't care about that. It's like, doc, what's going to happen? I'm going to put a cast on it. You're going to need to do this and this and this. I'll see you later. Mm -hmm. Right? That, it's the same thing. That's right. So here, here's my answer to your question. Why don't you ask the question again? Huh? Yeah, the question is, I don't think you've talked a lot about how to know. So I'm asking now, like, how do you know what to do in the deal and when? How do you know when to hold back and when to ask? Okay, so it's just this simple. I know I am not going to give an offer unless somebody pisses me off like a suspect. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give an and I'm going to give a ridiculous offer just to piss them off because mm -hmm. not to be vengeful. It's just to wake them up because mm -hmm. it's like you think you, and, and half the time I don't even do that anymore. The only, I know the only time I'm going to give the offer is once I have all the information. We talked about building the bricks, you know, like the brick wall. It's like every piece of information is another brick in your, in your wall, yeah. right? Um, and not that I'm trying to build a brick wall between me and the seller, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get enough information so that I know what to do. Yeah, it's almost like a brick foundation. Right. The real premise of what's going on. That's right. So I am not, I know that I have to do my, my opening call, mm -hmm. I know I have to do a closing call, and they could be the same call. Mm -hmm. I need to fill out the prospect suspect form, and I need to go look at the house. Yeah, I am not doing anything before that. Mm. And if I am, I'm only guessing. Yeah, and you tell them so. So when they have questions and they want the offer sooner than that, I answer the question just enough to keep the conversation going so I can get the rest of the information. Mm. So... Like, uh, let me give you an example. Um, how much is your offer? Yeah. What's your offer, Bill? Right. So I don't know yet. I haven't finished gathering the information. If I give you an offer now, it's not going to be fair to you because mm. I'm going to lowball it because I don't have enough information. Mm. So if you want the most amount mm -hmm. of money for a house, then we need to keep going here. I that's, need to get more good. information. Yeah, because I had that happen to me yesterday, uh, a couple of days ago. Right. Guy's actually redoing the house. And he, it's not rented, so he doesn't really know. It's his first one. Right. So he wasn't trying to be a wise ass. He says, you know, can you tell me? Like, not really, because if I do, it's going to be low. He's not going to like right. it. Let's just. So I didn't push it. I just said, that's okay, because he was very amenable to everything else. We had a great conversation. Okay. and so yeah, just terms. because you jumped right into it. So let's let's say that you were persistent. Yeah, like, well, I, why can't you tell me a number? <laughs> Okay, so I got I got an idea. What's the lease that you would take for the house right now? Oh, yeah. 170. Is it the best you can do? Yeah, I got partners, and I don't think they go lower than that. So I think you need to understand something. If I come and bring you money for this house the way you want me to bring money, mm. it's a big pile of cash, mm -hmm. and it's easily accessible to me. Yeah. So it's going to be a smooth sale. Mm. So... Is that really the best you're going to do? Well, I like that one. See, I don't have that one down. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. So go ahead. So uh, 160? Yeah. Well, we're getting closer. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that's why I let you do my, my uh, negotiation. So let me ask you this question. If I don't give you the 160, what are you going to do? I am guess I'm going to wait for another buyer. So is that really the best you can do? And this person's been waiting since January. Uh, 155? It's a big bag of cash. I know, 155. 155. Are you sure? Yeah, 155. You're so if me. I don't buy for 155, you're going to let me walk you're away? You're killing me. My wife will kill me more than... No, 155. So if I don't buy for 155, you're going to walk away? Um, uh, if, if for now, I am. Yeah? Yeah. You're sure now? Because yeah. I'm ready to walk. Well, would you buy for one fifty five? I was thinking that my number should be like down in the forty somewhere. Oh, uh, okay, so that's enough. Yeah. So you get well, yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a couple of those, but I didn't do all of the ones you got. Okay, so if you're listening to this recording, you should go back mm. and you should rewind. Ru you should it write, those write, those write those down. Write those down because I've never done that <laughs> on the podcast before. I no, go to my coaching group. 
yeah, but not on my podcast. Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on with the prospect suspect form. And this is all because we're talking about the asking and the estimated value, and they're stuck on a number and they're insistent on you wanting an offer, yeah. which will happen. Mm-hmm. So we just covered that. Okay. Yeah, so that was the lead, what's the lease you would take. Right. The next thing that's on the form is the names on the deed. Now, why do we care about the names on the deed? Well, you, you learn can, this the hard way. Yeah, you can talk to one person and find out there's three others that are on the deed, or that's not the person on the deed. It's the son, the, the daughter, the whoever. You're not talking to the person who's going to make the decision. That's really what's important, right. who can sign the document and who's going to make the decision. Right. Right? Well, that is that is correct, but I'm going to make it so much easier. And, you're, and it's not that I'm trying to trump what you're saying or anything like that. But no, I just, just want to make it con- so much easier. Let's, let's make a verb out of a noun. Concise it, Bill. Yeah. What's the definition out of, of a closing? Uh, an adjective. A closing? Um, deed transfers from seller to buyer. So there's a transfer of names on the deed. Yeah. So if I'm, if I'm expecting to own this property, mm-hmm. I want to talk to the person that's going to sign the document. Yep. Because it's the only way I'm going to get a closing. Mm-hmm. is the whatever names are on the deed. So I don't want to go through the whole rigmarole of talking to somebody on the phone for a half an hour, 45 minutes, going out to the house, spending an hour or two out at the house, maybe more. I'm going to go all the way through. I'm going to write my documents. I'm going to do all this stuff and then find out, oh, wrong one. Mm-hmm. I'll give you a classic example. A friend of mine, um, from a friend of mine. Yeah, that guy. It's a girl. That girl ha- has a house out of she, state. She lives in Connecticut. The house is in the Midwest somewhere on a mm-hmm. lake. Beautiful house. Yeah. Right. So one of my coach, I gave it, to, I gave the deal to one of my coaching clients because he's out that way. Mm-hmm. So uh, he's actually got a buyer. She's she's motivated. You know, she's got a half a million dollar house she's paying $4,000 or $4,500 a month for. Has been for several years. She moved to Connecticut to marry her husband, Mm -hmm. right? Long story short, she keeps telling me about how her ex-husband will sign the documents, no problem. Mm -hmm. Until we presented him with the documents, Mm -hmm. he all of a sudden decided he needed to talk to the bank. The further I get into the deal, I find out he's it's a small town and he's in the good old boy club and plays golf with these dudes. And there you go. Wow. So now we have for absolutely no reason at all, because the documents I used were, were not transferring a deed. They were a contract to transfer the deed. Mm-hmm. Are now The bank is now in the middle of our deal dictating what they're allowing us to do and I cannot and she's even got an attorney involved and he's telling her the same thing they cannot do it it's 100% against the law what they're doing the bank yeah wow because they can't dictate because they're talking about triggering a due on sale clause and the only way you can trigger a due on sale clause is to pass a deed Mm. and it didn't we're not passing a deed it's a lease or something it's a contract for it's a it's a land contract it's Mm. a contract for deed Mm mm-hmm so the only way the deed passes is if we perform what we say we're going to perform, one of which is we bring all the money to the table with our buyer. And she's been paying all the fees, and he hasn't been paying anything? That's right. What a dick. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. And he's completely stopping the deal. No wonder she's not married to him anymore. So, so, Sorry. Uh, so I told her, here's what you do. I'm not getting in the middle of you and your ex-husband, but here's what you do. You tell him, I'm stopping the mortgage payment. I'm not paying Perfect. anymore this month. Perfect. And when you sort it out, I'll start paying again. Perfect. Either me or the buyer will start paying. Perfect. And he doesn't want to ruin his credit, and he doesn't want to look that bad with the bank. So now we're getting yeah, some Yeah, totally. You know, that's a total right thing to do in that right. case. It's not even vindictive. It, what right. he's doing is ridiculous. She's been paying for years, and he has to make a stink. Right. He's so got no business. My point in bringing up name on the deed is yeah. when we started this deal, I was a little bit loose with it because it was my friend, and I didn't hammer this. Yep. And he, look where I am. I, I spent two hours just drafting the documents because mm-hmm. I made specific documents for this property. Yeah. They were specific documents. Two hours just, I, I probably got, and it's not even my deal. I probably have six or seven hours into this deal. And look what happened. I don't have the, I don't have the person, the person that name was on the deed is in an agreement with what we're doing and mm-hmm. we're fumbling around trying to fix it. 
Mm-hmm. So huge lesson there. Huge sure. lesson. Sure. And I still make those mistakes. So I expect everybody listening to make those mistakes. So in a case like that, you really should just talk to all parties and not assume one person's speaking it's correctly. It's going to come down to how much time you put into a deal. Yeah. It, it is is the people that needs to uh, are the people that need to be in the deal sitting at the table when you're explaining it. Mm-hmm. And is everybody in agreement? You know, those are what I call committee sales. You got to have a committee, yeah. and this is a committee sale. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to get we have to get the banker, we have to get the lawyer, we have to get the owner, we have to get the owner ex husband. It's a committee deal. It's like it's like we have a committee. You shouldn't and even have the bank in the committee. And the committees never. Any committee I've ever been part of never do anything. They can't agree because everybody has an opinion and there's not one person in charge. Yeah. And and to me, I'm gonna I'm gonna step on a, on a limb here because I'm gonna say something that you people may not even want to listen to my podcast anymore. But to me, that's a Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. Everybody everybody wants to do you help everybody else, but there's nobody in charge. Yeah. There's not anybody that says no. This is the way we're doing it. Mm-hmm. And and if you want to get something done, you need that. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, so property description. I'm not going to cover all this stuff because all that's for, all that's for, listen to me, all that's for, what is it? The only reason all it's for is? Report building. Oh. Well, how many beds have? Oh, I put a roof on. Oh, that's nice. What color did you pick? <laughs> right. It's report building. That's all it is. Yeah. Okay, so it's, you know, bedrooms, bathrooms, square feet. Now, obviously... For a very long time, I didn't buy two-bedroom properties, so it helped me decide that I wasn't going to buy a two-bedroom property. But nowadays, I don't have as much on that, uh, mostly because uh, my daughters have taught me a tremendous lesson. They're millennials, and millennials nowadays would rather have smaller spaces yeah. <clears throat> than the bigger spaces. Until they, they have don't two, want to take care of them. Until they have two babies. Yeah. Right? But like like <laughs> Emma, you know, they, 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 they don't need more than a couple rooms. Yeah. You know, they, they just prefer to be concise and small and cheap and not mm-hmm. have to take care of it. Mm-hmm. So two bedrooms nowadays is not a big deal. Uh, it used to be 10 years ago because mm-hmm. everybody wanted a family. Nowadays, that's not true. Small. Um, what about square footage? Yeah, so. Um, Usually you say you don't want to go under 1,000. Most people don't know the square footage of our house. So when I ask them what's the square footage, well, take a guesstimate. Yeah. Uh, 800 square feet, 1,000 square feet, 2,600 square feet, whatever. Yeah. It doesn't matter because all you need to do is type the address into Google and and one of the 15 different sites will tell you. Mm-hmm. It'll tell you the taxes. It'll tell you all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it really doesn't matter because- No, I'm more interested. Uh, you change your mind on the two bedroom. You used to say also you don't like going under 1,000 square feet. Yeah. Is that looser now? Yeah. Well, it depends on the deal, right? Yeah. So- Okay. Uh, but that's the only time, that's the only evaluation I ever did in that in that section. Okay. Okay. Underneath that, it says, is the house listed with an agent? Yes mm-hmm. or no? Mm-hmm. You need to know that. Uh, will that stop you from doing a deal? No. It's just a matter of how you do the deal, how you do the transaction. At the end of the day, here's what happens. If there's a realtor involved, they're going to want a commission. And that commission is coming from the the proceeds of the sale, which you're providing. Yep. In other words, you're bringing the money to the deal. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to be a creative real estate investor, which we've covered a lot, creative real estate investor simply means bringing the least amount of money to the table so you can do the most amount of deals. Right. So you can like leverage your money as far as you can go and buy as many properties and, and control as many assets as possible. Yep. That's a creative real estate investor. And there's nothing derogatory about that. It's actually very clever. Mm-hmm. Most think if you're not using money that you're you're like lesser than everybody else. It's actually the other way around. Yeah. Don't you have Just, don't you have your own money to buy right. it? The society doesn't realize that. Yeah, if you're buying one house, that's one thing. But if you right. want to buy two, 10, 20, 100. Right. I mean, it's, you can only go so far with your own credit, no matter what it is. And if you go back to episode, let me see here. Episode number 156, which is the one right before this, is Startling Discovery, Money Kills Real Estate real estate Profits. Mm-hmm. We explain it in that episode fully. Mm-hmm. So if you think what we're talking about is wrong, actually the worst thing in the world is to have money when you're doing real estate. Well, it, it slants your way of thinking. Here's a comparison. Who's a better business person? The kid who got handed the business by daddy-o, right. rich all his life, or the guy who made it to that point right. on his own? 
Good point. See? Yeah. That's a total difference. So when somebody walks in, oh, I got all this money, I buy whatever I want, how hard is that to do? But if you can do it without money, you're clever, you're, you're think, putting together I think good you're, deals. You're like, you're like dancing around the hot topic. And here's the, here's the hot topic that I that I have found. Yeah. People that make people with money are not worried about making mistakes because they can write a check and fix it. Mm-hmm. Where the guy that doesn't have money is going to pay more attention to not making a mistake because he can't pay for it. That's right. So, so the people that don't have money are going to be more cautious with their deals. They're going to try things more. Mm-hmm. They're gonna they're gonna ask more questions. They're gonna ask like we just talked about it a few minutes ago, like we did the role playing yep. about uh, you know is that the best you can do? They're gonna mm-hmm. do more of that. Mm-hmm. Where the guy that has you know plenty of money and could write a check for it, he'll stop at one sixty. He wouldn't have got to the one fifty, right? Because he's got the one sixty and he thinks it's a good rate of return for his money. Mm-hmm. So I think one's working harder, the other one's a bit lazy. Yeah. Some of us can't afford to be lazy, huh? <laughs> Some of us can't. <laughs> so, uh, so the so we're gonna ask them if it's listed, and if it is, we're gonna ask them how long. For a very long time, I didn't deal with listed houses. I will tell you if the house is listed and the realtor is there. Uh, no offense to you, realtors that are listening to me, but they the number two the two people that have blown up most of my deals is the realtor and the attorneys or the closing agents mm-hmm. because they put their two cents in there, and they and they don't know what they're talking about. You would think they know what they're talking about, but they don't. No, they know what they, they know. So if they see something else, they say, oh, you can't do that. Yeah. Like, well, just the example you gave before this, the bank got in the way. Yeah. You can't do that? Of course you can. Yeah, it's completely legal what they're doing because they're talking about triggering a do-on-sale clause, and the only way you can trigger a do-on-sale clause is to pass a deed, and we're mm-hmm. not doing that. I think you, an attorney could say, oh, it's okay. It's not a problem. They go, okay, never mind. But they don't back down, do they? No. <laughs> well, now they have to be right. Yeah. All right, so the next thing that we're going to ask is, is the house vacant or is it occupied? And obviously, if it's vacant, we circle vacant. Um, if it's occupied, we want to know, is it occupied with an owner or with a tenant? Mm-hmm. So we would circle owner or tenant, mm-hmm. okay? That's going to make a big difference. Why does that make a big difference? Do you know? I'm not trying to give you a trick question here. The big difference is is if they're living in the house and they mm-hmm. have to move out, mm-hmm. that's a different type of deal structure. Mm-hmm. If it's a tent that's in there, now we might want to dig a little bit more and ask, well, how did you get the house? Because mm-hmm. it, it, it often comes down to an accidental landlord right? where they had a house. I'll give you a classic example. They had the, So uh, uh, you're going to be Mabel and I'm going to be Bill. And we're married. Mm-hmm. Okay? okay. So Mabel and Bill have this house, and we go get, we get, we're going to, we're young, and we go buy this house together. Well, sooner or later, Mabel and Bill don't get along anymore, and Mabel anymore. goes on her way, and I want a divorce, and there you go. So what do they have? They have this house, right? Yeah. So, okay. So I decide, Mabel, you know what? Uh, I'm going to buy the house from you. I own the house. I'm going to stay in the house. Mm-hmm. Okay. Here's your money, Mabel. So now I got the house, mm-hmm. right? And I'm living there, and I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm raising the kids, whatever, you know, whatever I'm doing, I'm kind of like chugging along and kind of like living a new life. All of a sudden, here comes Gertrude. Oh, I like Gertrude. And it kind of like goes slow and easy, but next thing you know, um, I spent the night with Gertrude at her house. And then it was two nights. Mm-hmm. And then it's three nights. And the next thing you know... Gertrude and I, and this is over the course of months or weeks or whatever, maybe years, Gertrude and I are like practically living, living together. And I say to her, I say, hey, Gertrude, you know, we should do something because you're paying a mortgage and I'm paying a mortgage and we really should just like not do that. Yeah, don't need two houses. Right. It got okay. serious enough for one. So, so there you go. Mm-hmm. That's one example. Mm-hmm. Another example is you and uh, Mabel and I, you and you and you, uh, Bill and Mabel, um, uh, Mabel are going to like, oh, you know what? Let's have kids. Okay. So now we have three kids and the house isn't big enough. Yeah. So Mabel's like pressuring me like, we got to move. We got to move. We got to move. Okay. So we go find another house. It's like the best house. It's like the best deal. That's totally, oh my God. We got to buy it. Totally. My cousin did that a couple of years ago. <clears throat> right. And gets stuck with the little house. Right. Couldn't sell it. <clears throat> and then and then we move and figure out how to buy the house and move. Now we got this other house and we're supposed to sell it so we can like help finance this other mm-hmm. and it doesn't sell. No. What do we do? We can't afford two mortgages. We can't sell it. We rent it. Right. Accidental landlord. Sure. 
Okay, that so. exactly happened to my cousin. So just before they were going to rent it, somebody called, can I lease it? Right. And did the lease option like, like she heard it someplace. Right. Some, a, a buyer called to do it. That's strange. Right. She learned it somewhere. But that totally happened. I drove by a house last night, block around, away from my house, driving by like two, a young guy and a, and a looks like husband and wife, young youngsters, for rent. Oh, I got to come back and get the phone number and give them a call. Exactly. Would you consider a rent to own? So the reason why I bring that up here is because if it's occupied with a tenant, you might want to like dig in a little bit deeper and find out why, because you could have an accidental landlord and that'll help you with their motivation level. And you got to find about the tenant, the lease, how long is it, right. the tenant's okay, you know, what kind of situation it is. Are they moving? Are they leaving? The next thing is, is does the house need repairs? Yes or no. And then you follow that question up with, what do you estimate the contractor repair cost would be? And the reason why you're doing that is because <clears throat> I've run into too many people that are contractors themselves and tell me three or $4,000 because they think that's how much materials will cost and they don't put their labor in there. Yeah. Or the or, handyman guy. Yeah. Well, I did my the, husband do it, do, do, doing it himself, and they just estimate it real low. Right. Or they're like my wife, and they have these grandiose ideas of what they're going to do and have no idea what's involved. They just saw it on TV, on one of the, one of the TV shows that mm -hmm. does all that stuff, and got this idea it should be done and has no idea what it's going to cost. Just wants it. And just guessed. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh and no disrespect to my wife, it's just that's her. She just doesn't know how to do that. So <clears throat> we use, I'm not going to get into this now. If you go back in some of the other episodes, we use actual square footage uh, to figure out what the repair cost should be. Mm -hmm. uh, it's It fluctuates all the way from $10 to $30 a square foot, depending on what, the, what it is. And... Um, then we know what the repair cost would be. Mm -hmm. okay. Depending on how much needs to be done. Right. <clears throat> and I guesstimate that uh, when I'm doing the prospect, prospect suspect form because I know what my most common number is. I use that common number, and I know I, I just put it in my numbers, mm -hmm. right? All right, and then the most important question on the form is next. The most, the most, if you haven't heard me, the mm -hmm. most important part question on the form is mm -hmm. when did you want to move by? That's the motivation question. Now, obviously, if they have a tenant in there and they're not living in the house, don't ask them when they're going to move by. They already it's did. Stupid. They already did. Yeah. It shows you're not paying attention. Right. So, in that particular case, you're going to ask them when do they want to sell by or when do they want to close by. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that'll tell you their motivation. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and you'll be uh, very surprised to find out the littlest things that motivate people. You'll be very surprised. Like, like for example, uh, the guy that I was buying this house in Naugatuck with that we've been talking about for a couple weeks now, uh, his motivation was is just driving out there and taking care of the house. He doesn't have to cut. He pays somebody to cut the grass. Mm. He doesn't have to shovel the snow. He, he just goes out there and checks it. But he goes out there like twice a week, and he's just sick and tired of driving out there. Yeah. And that that's what's motivating him, right? It's not the money. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just talked about he's going to let it sit for a month while his buddy gives him an answer. It's funny. Some people have enough money that things like that are just yep. less aggravation to write the check. Yep. That's the guy with the, with the money. Yep. And uh, other people are working harder to make things happen. <clears throat> okay. So the next section is the mortgage information. I It's not on the prospect suspect form mostly because we can't fit it. We should put it on here and I haven't just haven't spent the time because we have too many other things we're doing. Mm -hmm. But- the mortgage information, if you go to the for sale by owner script, there's a section in there that says, oh, yeah. a lot of times we do something with the financing. You have a mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. And if you ask that question, that's much easier and yeah. appe more, more appease, appeasing than, well, how much is the mortgage? Sure. Right. Yeah, this form is more of a form to fill out. It doesn't have a lot of script in it. Right. I've seen you had another sheet of, of several pages that yeah. explains everything, more questions. Uh, but yeah, the, the for sale by owner has a few. It's more of a scriptish thing. Less more script there, less information. More information here, less script. But between the two of them, you get some great questions. Right. I threw a few in when I was doing uh, a multifamily the other day. And I think I just thank God I remember the right thing because they said right. no. I went back and said, well, maybe I got back in. Just the right sentence it's important just keep the papers in front of you pull the sentences yep. read them so when i hit this section i say a lot of times we do something with the financing um or i'll start it with i really like the house i think we can do something but a lot of times we do something with the financing mm -hmm. you have a mortgage right 
And they'll be like, yeah, okay, how much is it? And yeah. it's just that simple. And but if, the, see, you have a mortgage, right? Yeah. I know you got a mortgage. Just tell me what it is. Right. So at that point, they're going to tell you how much they owe for the equity. I mean, uh, how much they owe without the equity. Mm-hmm. So they're going to say, well, I owe $140,000. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. How much are the monthly payments? Does that include the insurance and the taxes? Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's how we fill out this section here. Then I ask them, do you know what the annual taxes are? Mm-hmm. And do you know what the insurance is? And I write those down. And then I'll ask again. Those are in the payment, right? Mm. Just to make sure. Mm-hmm. Both and, of those are in the payment, right? And even if it's in payment, you want to know what it is. Right. Because I mean, things change. I mean, yeah. taxes, insurance, it changes. And you just want to know. Right. And then the rest of the form is is our is our uh, attempt for dealing with some multifamily houses. It's like, what's the rental income? What's the condo fees? Uh, the workout equity. Uh, work out what equity is. That's pretty much taking what they owe and dividing it into the asking price. So we know what our percentages are, our loan to value ratio yeah. uh, that we've talked about in many other episodes. I'm not going to do that now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, what's the loan to value ratio? That's mm-hmm. the LTV, right? And then that, that number, well, the reason why that's bolded is because that's the number that we're going to. So if you go to my seven offer structures, you know, my, my seven deal offers mm-hmm. the, the way we structure them and if you haven't been there yet go to flipping houses for rookies.com forward slash free stuff and there are seven or eight videos there that explain it fully there's no you don't have to buy nothing it's all right there mm-hmm. it'll tell you which offer to start with right because you start with the lowest offer and then you work your way up so mm-hmm. if if the loan to value ratio is 60 percent, that's a wholesale deal you start you could start with that offer but you could go up and go up and go up depending on what they want right there's enough equity in the house that the other offers would be feasible right so if they've got 40 percent worth of equity there's four or five different deals that you can offer them depending on what they're willing to do with their equity how much equity they're willing to give you is what it comes down to mm-hmm. okay and once you figure that out you'll know which offer to give them right okay so i want to go to the second page because we got to buzz through this hum- what time is it is it um, okay so we're kind of at the at the end of the episode so what happens is, and I found this to be with my coaching clients because I work so closely with them, is there are going to be, uh, there's going to be interjection between you and the seller, obviously, and they're going to throw you off the script. Okay. You don't have to do this the way I just did it. Sometimes they'll start talking and I'll just take notes and fill in the blanks and I don't go back and ask those questions. Right. But then you go back and try to you know, yeah. If you have to jump, you jump, but then get them back on track coming through. Right. So the, the purpose of the prospect suspect form questions is to elicit more information randomly or when they when they knock you off your script to use these questions to get more information. And I'm just going to rattle through some of these questions. Mm-hmm. You can go get the download at flippinghousesforrookies.com forward slash free stuff uh, prospect suspect form. Right. So some of them are, do you, obviously, do you have a house for sale? Uh, this is a good one. What were you expecting to get from this call? Mm. Right. Here's another one. Was I able to help you with that today? And did you use these when you get kind of stuck yeah. on the form? So it's, just, it's just to keep the, see, the most important thing that you need to understand is, is that you are going to give them an offer. So I hold my seller hostage as long as I can on giving them the offer. I do not give them an offer until I'm goddamn ready to give them the offer. And I'm holding them hostage. So they will stay interested in you until they get what they want. Mm. As soon as they get what they want, they'll either say yes or no and they'll leave. Yeah. So I'm going to hold them hostage as long as I can. I don't feel like I can give them enough of an offer or a good enough offer, or an offer that will satisfy them until I've gone through this whole process that I'm talking about. Because if you try to do it, it's a premature offer. Hmm. And you will, you will, you will like, you'll lose it. You won't make the right offer. Hmm. It's like saying to a 10 year old girl, you know, do you want to kiss Johnny? Ew, I hate boys. Mm -hmm. Well, that's like when they call up and say, what's your name? What's the address? Okay. What's the offer? It's the same thing. How, how, How can you do that? Mm, you, don't they have didn't. Enough, you don't have enough information. No, they didn't do that. Right. So here's another good question. 
once we close on the property, what were you planning on doing with the money? Mm. And that converts somebody from a cash offer to a terms deal because when you find out they're just going to put it in a bank and get like a half a percent, you can show them how they can get 9% and turn them into a private lender. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's a multiple bunch of different ways on that. Well, so, I think you've taught me that when you find out what you're trying to do with it, that opens the door to, well, we can structure the deal such and such a way that you, I'll help you do that. Right. And you don't need more money than such and such because all you need is to do that. Well, or, it's just the deal that we were talking about last week. And I, and I keep talking about because it it's fresh on my mind. Mm-hmm. So so the guy that, that owes a house for 245000 the house is worth two hundred. Yeah. He, he's 50 grand upside down. Mm-hmm. So the way I propose the deal to him is, is well, they're, how are you going to get the fifty grand? Well, I'm either going to borrow it from my in-laws or I'm going to go to the bank. Mm. Okay, so you're going to have a payment, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I have an idea. How about I pay you fifteen hundred, mm-hmm. and you pay that extra six or seven hundred dollars on the mortgage? Now you don't have to go get a loan. He says you can do that. I'm like, yeah, totally. Yeah, see, that's where you're the deal maker. Because I mean, I've seen you do a lot of things. I don't know if I would have thought of that. Right. You know, because you just transfer. But I, have you done that before? Or do you just think that fast. No, I've done that before. Yeah, okay. I did that with a house in Southington. Okay. So the point is, is that I, I if we close in a property, what were you planning on doing with the money? Now yeah. it's a reverse because he has to owe money. But I'm asking him, what were you planning on getting the money? Because mm. it's a logistical, it's a problem. hard fact. He's stuck. He can't. He can't sell the house unless he does something right. with it. It's not going away. Um. So here's another good one, which I don't use enough. Mm-hmm. If you sold your house tomorrow, what would happen or what would change in your life? Mm. And that's going to give you what problem they're trying to solve. Right. Well, I'm going to be able to spend more time with my grandkids. Mm-hmm. Okay. So do you not spend enough time with your grandkids? Not well. Yeah, because they like live like in Virginia and I want to go to Virginia and I'm in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. That's like a transfer. Yeah. You know? So if you ask that question again, so what would happen if you don't sell your house? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, if you sold your house tomorrow, what would happen or change in your life? Well, I'm making like, you know, 80 grand now at my job and I got an opportunity to move to Oregon and get a job for 200000 and And uh, my girlfriend lives out there. Phew. That's a win-win. You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, things like that happen. Here's yeah, and another- then obviously they're more willing to like leave more on the table for the deal, for the opportunity than stick around here. So here's another, and there's a lot of these are closing questions. So here's another one: uh, What would happen if you didn't, if you don't sell the house the way you expect to, which I did to you before? Yeah, it's a takeaway sale. Yeah, right. So because people don't, every seller that approaches you, every seller that approaches you, is only thinking about them and the profit they're going to get from the deal. Mm-hmm. Every investor does that. They'll call me up and say, "I got this deal," and they think they got a fifty thousand dollar deal, and they're already spending that money in their yep. head. Yep. Right, they're already spending that money. Bill, I'm already retired. Yeah, see, <laughs> you know what I mean. So it's like, yeah. So every seller that comes to you has an objective for triggering the sale, and the more you understand that objective, the better off you're going to be. Mm-hmm. Okay, let me see. I'm going to give you one or two more, and then we're going to move on. Uh, here's another good one. Do you feel in control of the sale of this house? Oh, you asked them that. Wow. I haven't. Right. Wow. Do you feel? I remember that one. In the control of the sale of this house. Tell me more about that one. Well, take the the uh, take the uh, uh, accidental landlord. Is he in control of the sale? He's trying, but he's not in control of the sale. No. Oh. Take take the for, a lot of for sale by owners mm-hmm. are not in control of the sale. That's why they're for sale by owners because mm-hmm. they tried to use a realtor and they got a bad story or a bad experience or they they owe too much money on this house. Uh, take a slot deal, a sandwich lease option transfer deal. Right? Yeah. If you don't know what that is, go to flippinghousesforrookies.com, free stuff. And you can see what that is. One of the seven offers. If you if you, if you you over-leveraged on a property, are you in control of the sale? Mm. No. Right? Nope. Once a buyer agreed to buy your house, what did you envision would happen at that, at that point? <laughs> you mean the armored car would drive up my next morning and come out with or, a or <laughs> what I'm asking that question for is is like where are you going to move How, you know you got an 80 year old guy yeah. that's got you know dumpsters full of stuff in the house yeah. how's he going to get it out yeah well 
the point of that one, I mean, we, we had this a couple of weeks ago with the guy like, so when you sell the house, you know, I'm going to go to Florida. Where? I, I, I think I'm going to go here. Where You got a place to go? Not yet. Right. Or where are you going to go? I don't know. Well, how are they going to sell the house if they don't know where they go? And then I could go out on the street. And those are going to bother you because if they have a very clear, specific goal in their mind, then the house transaction will be a lot because they've already moved on in their mind to the next thing. Yeah. And the house is in their way. Yeah. And that's what you that's where you need to be. That's your sweet spot. When you get there, yeah. because they're really clear in their mind what they're gonna do. We have to be in Denver in six weeks. Right. Because our son married, has a child, and he's he's in the service and then he's and he's gotta go to Afghanistan or where he's ever he's gotta go. For and like a couple of years. There, and she's there without the without help. Just she they just got there. A couple and of months in a, a house baby, alone, and now she's not a pregnant job. again, and they need help. Yep. And we bought we bought a hundred and eighty thousand dollar house for ninety two thousand, subject to gave them five grand in moving money, and off they went. And sell it for one ninety. Yep. Okay. This is my beautiful renovation job. Yes, you did do a good job. <laughs> on that. Cost us a lot of money, but we did a good job. Does that make sense? So those are, those are some more questions. I'm going to end off with talking about oh. the prospect. Yeah. Third page pre-qualification form. Mm. So the only thing that you really need to make sure make pay, pay attention to is the top six questions. The rest of it is just to help you. And so just to make sure that there really are a, a, a prospect, right. not a suspect giving you baloney. Right. Oh yeah, I really want to sell the house. So here you go. I'm going to just read these off at the end of the end because you could just read the document. The document is self-explanatory. You could go get it at flippinghousesforrookies.com forward slash free stuff. It's mm -hmm. prospect suspect form. It's the prospect suspect form has three pages, and this is the third page. And these are yes no answers, uh, sort of. So the first question is: When does the prospect want to move or close by? Oh, yeah, and that's under forty five days, over forty five days. Right. Okay. Then the rest of them are yes or no. Mm -hmm. Is the seller willing to d delay the cash out if needed? Yes or no. In other words. Do they want all their money in 30 days or are they willing to do a terms deal with you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are the mortgage payments less than 85% of what they owe, which means you can lease, right? Mm -hmm. and that includes the taxes and insurance. So the question is, is are the mortgage payments less than 85% of what you can lease for, including the taxes, insurance, and the condo fees? If you can, you can do the lease option. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did the answer sell? Did the answer i give that to you again. Did the seller answer all the questions from the prospect suspect form without resistance when talking to them? Mm -hmm. Were they in conversation or were they combative? Cooperative. Yeah. Well, you always say, like, are, are they trying to get some help or they, they don't need your help, they don't need you? And the biggest thing that you need to realize is is the number one indicator of a suspect is, is they have plan B. And they're just checking you out to mm -hmm. see if their plan is the best plan. Mm-hmm just in case they don't miss something. That's the I, I, an epitome yeah. of a suspect. Yes, yeah, so you ask them, what are you going to do if I don't buy the house? Oh, I got this other thing going on right. here. Oh, great. Exactly. All right, next question. How do you know, is, how do you know if it's true, if it's just a lie? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See video. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the next question is, is, do you feel you can add value to the property for your for your prop? This is this is for us as buyers. Yeah, so do you feel you can add value to the property for your profitable and fast exit strategy? Mm. So uh what I look at from there is is what value can I add? Mm -hmm. Right? So how can I how can I add value to the seller? And I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Mm -hmm. Uh the eighty year old guy that uh has four dumpsters that he's gonna remove from the house. You can say to him, just take what you want. We'll take the rest. Right. Uh, another added value is is that, uh, you know, you can use my attorney. You don't have to hire an attorney. So these are added values for the seller selling right. to us, not like to the house. I thought you meant to the house. Well, it Adding, could be to the house. Right. But that's why I'm making the examples. But what because, added but, well, value to, to buy it, you, you have give, to yeah. give the deal? Yeah. Right. now To buy it, you have to give him value. Right. Okay. Yeah, because in other words... 
where else, what could you offer him that nobody else could offer him? Yeah, why should he sell to you? You can do such and such. The realtor's not going to come in and offer to clean out a house <laughs> for dumpsters. They're not going to do that. You know, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, it's just a funny thought. <laughs> yes, maybe, maybe, you know, whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, well, they're not buying the house. Well, we are. Right. So we do those things. And then another one is, is do you think the seller is just motivated for cash? Or do you think that they'll uh, they'll they'll accept the creative offer? So mm. uh, this is where we're going to end off. There's more questions here. You should go get the document and you should fill out each one of these documents for every deal you do in the beginning, so that you can stay in check. No pun intended, but in check mm. with making sure you're dealing with the motivated sellers. Okay, so you should go. Uh, we don't use this document enough. We don't promote this document enough. Mm. Okay. Especially in the beginning, you're right, because we all have wishful thoughts and right. everything's perfect when we look at it and then later things can happen. So you might as well know what it is. And if it's a deal, do it. If it's not, just don't do it. Right. We'll find another one and just do that one. So the last the last thing I want to cover is is uh, what are they motivated for? Because a lot of times when my new coaching clients, what happens is is they call me and tell me how this person's really motivated. Hmm. So like my guy with the three-family house that was asking three hundred and ten for a $290,000 house, he's motivated to get an extra twenty grand. Mm -hmm. So he sounds really like, I'll show it to you. I'll do this and I'll do that. And he's doing everything to try to close you. Mm -hmm. That's not a motivated seller. That's a motivated suspect. Yeah. Right. Now, if I talked to the same guy and I told him that, you know, he's got $100,000 in equity, would you be willing to take your equity and payments? And he says, yes. Or what does that mean? Well, actually, I, you know, I, I, I often I'll pay a little bit more for you waiting for your money. Mm -hmm. but the way it works is, is, and I explained this to him, mm -hmm. and in his particular case, he had a mortgage of 190 I told him that we're going to write a document that actually encompasses that mortgage, and you give me a mortgage with your mortgage included in that mortgage. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make payments to you, and then you're going to make payments to your bank, and when I get ready to sell, you're going to get all your money. And if that's something that he's interested in, then he then he's motivated. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if he's just interested in getting three ten out of a two hundred ninety thousand dollar house, of course he's motivated to get his extra twenty grand. So, so it's just almost be like careful what the motivation is. It sounds like more the motivation is to get his money, not to sell the house. Right. There's two different motivations there. Right. So you just got to make sure that when you're looking for a motivated seller. That it's 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 a true painful or true uh, uncomfortable or a true burden mm. for the seller that they're trying to relieve themselves of, and sometimes it's debt, sometimes it's the inconvenience of taking care of the house, sometimes it's taxes, sometimes I mean there's a whole bunch of things, but it's not to get the most amount of money for the house. If that comes up that I, that they're trying to get the most amount of money for the house, then the motivation is incorrect motivation. Mm -hmm. It's it's a motivated suspect, is what it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we do? That's cool. We haven't we haven't done that before, have we? You don't no, over all the details. I don't think so. But that's like not our Bible, but it's. I mean, I don't go to the supermarket without a checklist. Right. You know. Right. So how are you gonna buy a house without like instructions, directions, uh, a format? Well, these three pages, especially the prospect suspect form questions, will get you in communication to find out what's really good. And I've only covered two or three of them. There's probably, I don't even know, I've never counted them. There's probably 30 of them on this page. Uh, they get you in converse, in communication with your seller so you can find out what's going on before you go to the house. Mm. You could even bring this with you and use these in the house. These are great questions, mm. these are closing questions. Mm. They're phenomenal questions, and we and the, and this and the and the pre checklist we don't we don't promote them enough. I mean, we have them; they're they're behind the prospect suspect form. Mm. We don't talk about them enough because it's just it's just. Uh, uh, I guess it's not fancy enough for people. It doesn't say, have a shiny object attached to it, so it's mm -hmm. like the people aren't interested. You know, it doesn't have a piece well, of software. We talk a lot about people being a little worried about the first few deals because it, it's it's new; they're not sure what to do. Right. You know, and not everybody has you for backup. So if you're on your own, you want to have the road map, the guide, and like additional questions just to double check the deal. If it's fine, go ahead. If it's not, get a better deal. Right. But you know, then you have to worry so much. So. By doing all of these questions, like you're saying, you can actually x-ray the deal. 
Mm. You know, you can find out what's going on. You're going to talk to the person enough. You're going to look at the house. You're going to. It's not just a uh, a bing bang boom deal. Right. You know, like you said, it's you're gonna you're gonna work on it, and you're gonna find out what the situation is, and you're gonna be able to make an intelligent through the investigation process. You'll just know what to do naturally. You know, uh, and I'd like to end off with this. This is what I want to end off with: is be careful. Be careful of this one thing. Sometimes you run into a motivated seller that's just going to throw the keys to the house at you. And when you do that, that's really good because you don't need to have a lot of education to get that house. Mm -hmm. Make sure you go through this process and do your due diligence and don't get stuck with a house that has some hidden secret or something because you didn't do this stuff we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And you will run into motive. There is a lot of motivated sellers. And you will run into them if you're doing if you're if you've done fifteen or twenty of nose to no toe to toe appointments, you will find one. Yeah. Okay. Just be careful when they're motivated that you don't you don't talk yourself into doing a deal that's only a hundred dollars a month positive cash flow, or it needs thirty thousand dollars worth of work and you're going to do it yourself, or blah blah blah. Just don't fall into that trap. Just make sure you, and then the reason why I say that is because my first couple of years, I bought a couple million dollars with the real estate and barely had a couple thousand dollars a month positive cash flow. In fact, there were months I had to come out of my pocket with the money to pay the mortgages because each house had a little bit of like, uh -uh to it. Hmm. Okay. So just, just realize that I learned that lesson the hard way. Uh, so just because they're motivated to throw the keys at you doesn't mean that you should take the deal. Well, I learned, I read some, oh, it was on a video, the audio, the audio I gave you the other day. I don't know if you caught it. But if, uh, when, when the, the price is really low, it's either the person's got a problem or the house got a problem. Right. right. That's what you're talking about. Like, make sure it's the motivation is the person. Right. It's not the house is a mess. Or if it is, at least you know when you can fix it and, yeah, and, well, you and adjust the numbers the cover it. Yeah, you adjust the price and you know, they might not tell you, but that ain't right. Okay, so um, please, 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 please go give us some reviews. I need reviews, especially on iTunes. I really, really need reviews. And uh, last a couple podcasts ago, uh, I offered my new book. Uh, if you give me a review, good, bad, or indifferent. If you give me a review and the uh, send me a support ticket telling me where you left the review so I can go read it. I will mail you a hard copy of the book uh, on me. So It's a hard uh, copy or uh, soft copy? No. It's a soft cover. Yeah. Hard copy meaning that it's not uh, a digital form. I got it. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. So Boom. I will mail you a physical copy of the a book. A real How's book, that? not a just a book. download. Yeah. It's, it's not take gonna it be to some the beach. ebook or something like that. Yeah. Um, so just go give us a review. I know I'm ethically bribing you to do that, but if you're going to take your time to leave us a review, uh, I want to give you and, – and if you don't want the book, that's fine. Leave me a review anyways or leave us a review. Um, I, I need to get my iTunes uh, – Ranking? Ranking up. I mean, I think we're number nine right now. I'm trying to get to number one, and I, and I would love your help. So if you're listening to the show and you're getting a lot of information from it or you're doing deals, please uh, tell others about it. Okay, so please give us a review. With that said, over and out. Thanks for tuning in to the hottest real estate topics on the planet with Bill and Pete. If you want to continue learning how to buy and sell real estate without money or credit, head over to FlippingHouses.club for some cutting-edge real estate wealth tools. Or contact us at info at FlippingHouses.club.